Um, before we get started, we're going to run a quick uh, behind the scenes video that shows a little bit about how the series came together from a post production perspective. <laughs> Mass Appeal started out as a graffiti magazine. It's pretty amazing how far we've come. We have music, we have a label, we have a film and TV and content department making great products like this series with a clan of mics and men. From the very beginning, we wanted to work with Adobe's Creative Cloud. We knew we need something as flexible as Adobe Premiere to actually do this properly. Our communication had to be really good overall because there were a lot of moving parts from animation to getting the interviews to work right and getting the archival to sit right. It was a beast. We shot close to half a petabyte of footage, shooting on a red helium, then 7.5K, and then archival, you're looking at well over 100 terabytes of media. These guys were everywhere, man. It was during the 90s. There were so many random consumer formats out there, like so much VHS footage, high 8 footage, 16 millimeter. We needed something that's going to be able to handle a million different formats and just accept them. <laughs> <laughs> the series sculpted around interviews that Sasha conducted with the living members. A lot of the story is told as men looking back at their lives together. The idea was to have them in this black void to conjure up this notion of them almost being in space, floating to who knows where in these conversations. In a lot of Sasha's stories, he likes to do a lot of animation. Having the editor cut a scene and then be able to dynamically link it to the animator or designer, and then they would be able to refresh that dynamic link. I gotta say, Adobe Premiere handled it very well. It was exciting, it, it moved, you know? The post on this moved really quickly. As far as the beginning, we knew we wanted to do this in a team project. A team project allows multiple editors to access the same project so that you're all working in the same environment with the same media and the same sequences. We had four editors, three assistant editors, two archival producers and two archival assistants working at the same time in a team project. That type of collaboration you can't really do in other platforms quickly. It is interesting, like, you know, you're ingesting all this media all day and you're watching and you're thinking, and then at night when you lie down and you have space from it, it starts to connect in different ways. And a lot of the work's done in your head, and Premiere makes it feel really fast, like you're part of this process that's always happening. Everyone wants to be able to have tools to make their films come to life. Adobe just makes it so much easier. So can you all please join me in welcoming the team behind Wu-Tang Clan of Mikes and Men. We have writer-director of the series as well as chief creative officer at Mass Appeal, Sasha Jenkins. <laughs> Senior director of post-production and technology at Mass Appeal, Nick Paciano. and lead editor and writer, Paul Greenhouse. So first of all, guys, I just want to start off by giving you a huge congratulations for such a masterful crafting of a really, really complex story. So, so, so beautifully done. So one more round of applause, please. Thank you. So, Sasha, obviously, when you look at a topic like the Wu-Tang Clan, you're not only talking about 25 years of deep, rich musical history, but then also the individual stories of all of the different members. H how did this project initially come about? Well, Riz and I share an agent in Hollywood. I'm not Hollywood, but I'm from Queens, and sometimes I do business in Hollywood. And the agent said that uh, RZA and Wu-Tang were finally ready to tell their story after 25 years. You know, are you interested in throwing your name in the hat? And I said, for sure. And I flew to LA for the day, meaning I got on a plane, met with RZA, and got back on a plane to New York specifically to meet with him. And um, 
you know, he told me, look, I've got all kinds of big name production companies and producers looking to do this. You know, why should you, why should I go with you? And I said, you can get anyone to do it, but they're not going to do what I'm going to do. And, you know, I'm of it. I'm native to it. Um, I used to publish a newspaper called Beatdown, which was the first newspaper or publication to ever put uh, Wu-Tang on the cover. So when their first single dropped, we put them on the cover. So their career and my career have sort of been um, hand in hand in some respects. So it took him about two to three weeks to make the decision. And he told me recently that it was his wife who said, give, the guy, <laughs> give that guy the job. So I always thank his wife every opportunity I get. Nice. So when you started out on this journey, how, how did you approach the process? Like, was it going through archival first? Was there an outline? Did you jump right into interviews? Well, we, you know, we, myself and the team, uh, just talked about what the film was about, and I talked about what was important to me. Um, and for me to understand hip hop, or to understand black music in America, you've got to understand the environment and the climate from which it comes. And so it would have been much easier to make a film about how great Wu-Tang is and what a special group they are but you know, so many people love Wu Tang, and you know, I'm from Queens, and I don't sometimes don't fully understand everything they're talking about. So why do people in Sofia, Bulgaria, love them? So I wanted to make a film that, you know, addressed the environment and the climate from which they came. And so with, with that sort of conversation and that and that mandate, you know, as a team from archival to editors to everyone who had their fingers on this project, these conversations are a part of it. And you do the research, and you 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 work through some of the questions you want to ask. And so then I go and do interviews, and I have a general framework of the things that I want to talk about from these questions that come from the research. But really, the conversations that I have with those guys are just conversations. And so in those conversations, um, you know, they don't feel like I'm interviewing them. Right. And they're in this black void, and they see someone who looks like them, who comes from a similar environment, and it creates a level of comfort um, that, I guess, produced what it is that's up on the screen now. Yeah. You know, you touched, uh, you guys touch on it in the, in the behind the scenes we just watched, but just the sheer amount of footage that comes out of 25 years and the archival and all of it. When you're setting up a project, and especially when you're setting up a documentary project, it's essential to get it set up properly in order to not just be in a mess at the end. <laughs> uh, Nick, how did you go about approaching it when, when the team at Mass Appeal started talking about this project? Well, you know, we, we looked at our infrastructure, we realized we had to do a lot of um, changes. So um, the first thing I did is I knew, noticed we needed more storage. So we went to edit chair, we got half a petabyte of storage uh, for our, our offline needs. Um, the other thing we did was uh, remodeled all the edit rooms. So we got everything upgraded to iMac Pros, 14 cores, fully loaded with memory, uh, proper monitoring, so it's like, you know, we wanted to make sure that, the, that these editors felt comfortable in these edit rooms and that they could look through all the footage um, properly. And then we also, too, set up, you know, archival stations and how to run all these extra lines. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a beast. <laughs> and why was the choice made to go with Premiere? The choice was made to go with Premiere, um, number one time. You know, from my years at Broadway Video, um, we're working with SNL, like, you know, we needed, you, you did a quick turnaround um, with um, products, with, especially when you're integrating animation. So Sasha and his stories, you know, always um, integrates animation. And, you know, it's, it's beautiful to, you know, be able to throw a sequence to a designer and animator very quickly in Premiere. You know, in other platforms, it's a little bit more tedious. And it's, it's good to see, it, it, it's good to be able to go through those changes quickly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Paul, I had a question for you, but we've actually already had one come in from the live stream. Uh, <laughs> what was the process like to outline such a complex story and then to, to dive into the editing of it? Yeah, I mean, I would say it started with conversation, like Sasha talked about, just kind of identifying what was interesting to everyone. We had a, a really big team and we would sit around a big table and talk about ideas. Um, and then the ideas and the themes, um, things that resonated with people, we kind of kept those in mind and then we started building around it. Um, but with the amount of material that we had, the amount of voices, it helped 
early on to kind of give us ourselves a framework to, to build within. Um, so that was early in the, in the process. And it evolves and it, and it changes as you're going. Um, but I, I would say that's how we started, is just through talking about it. I think sometimes nowadays, like, you know, people are so eager to get to work that they, they don't really consider that good ideas come from conversation. And this is a story about a collective. And, you know, I think one of the big ideas in the story and what these guys realize, like Ghostface in the last scene, he's like, I just realized we're a group, you know, and that the real reward of their life together is that they have one another. Um, and good ideas come from people because we all see things differently. Um, so I would say that was, that was a big key to the creative process. But he also understood what, it, what was important to me, you know, the ideas and themes that were important. And so I think he, he was able to process that and then bring his ideas in that mix to create, you know, what we did. I mean, there are little things like, you know, Ghostface Killer talks about a, a particular ice cream that you could get in public schools, which was <laughs> something that I remembered. And he just describes it and he makes a sound effect, you know. That is hip hop. And... Paul understands that. A lot of people don't understand that. It's those little things that give people the understanding of like the people who are making this film understand what it is and what's important. Yeah, you know, those themes I think are what was so striking to me about this series was there are these big themes, you know, family and depression and hope and success and failure. And you guys did such a wonderful job of telling them both as very personal, individual stories to each of the members, but then also in a way that felt very universal, that you could totally relate, even though like, I didn't grow up on Staten Island, I didn't have these experiences, but I could find pieces where I really could relate, which also ties into the Wu in general, like their music, like you talked about. How, why is the editing process so important in finding those themes and weaving them? How can like, one edit change the course of how you're telling a story? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know that it's like that you just like move a frame and it changes the story. I mean, to me, the stories are, stories in general to me are built around conflict. So the first thing that we really did was we identified a conflict and the conflict that we all decided was central. So there's, there's an episodic arc, which is a thread that carries over the four hours. And we identified that as being the conflict between um, brotherhood versus business. Because these guys had come together, they had this bond with one another, they viewed one another as brothers, um, but they w went into business with one another. And it was something that kept coming up for them. Um, because sometimes the, their experience doing business with one another um, interrupted their love for one another and their bond and their brotherhood. Um, and it was something that they navigated and probably still do. Um, so we knew that that was gonna guide us and propel us from the beginning. So that, that we set up in the, in the first couple of minutes and that carries through to the end. Um, and then each episode, we did a similar process where we said, all right, episode one, what's the conflict? Um, it's Wu-Tang versus their environment. So the first episode's about this group of guys trying to get out of Staten Island, out of poverty, and out of the housing projects where they live. Um, and they do it together by um, investing in one another and, and investing their time and, and energy in this Wu-Tang project and in music. In episode two, it's Wu-Tang versus the music industry because RZA and Jizza have previous experiences with the music industry where they're working for other people, they're not good experiences, and the projects fail so they decide that they're gonna do it on their own. Um, and they really develop their own plan and strategy and they follow through with it. Um, in episode three, it's Wu-Tang versus themselves. Um, and that really kind of, you know, continues the thread of business versus brotherhood. And it plays out through the conflict between, I would say, RZA and ODB um, because they're cousins, they're blood family. Um, but the conflict there, it's also like an example of a similar experience that they're all going through together. And then for me, the last episode is Wu-Tang versus their past. So 
once you identify like this one idea it, and, and you wrap your head around all the material and what everyone has to say, then you can start to kind of walk through an episode and create a structure for yourself. And, and that's how we approached it. So I wouldn't say that it was like, um, you know, that you could move something around because all films in general are, are modular, right? They're just like a sequence of scenes and sequences that are anywhere from, you know, two to four minutes long. And once you cut those, those are individual ideas and those can shift. So there's scenes in the fourth episode that at certain times in the process they existed in the first episode, but they do something different when you, when you meet them later. So like the scene where Deck and you God are returning to the place where they grew up that's in episode four. For a little while that might have been in episode one or episode two. But I think just kind of like trying to identify, you know, what the story is, what the conflict is that's at the center of your story, and then everything else is somewhat flexible. I mean, this episode especially jumps around a lot in time, um, more so than the other episodes, I would say, are more adhere to like a, a chronology. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I, I, one of the, you know, the theme of family obviously is one that's very strong. and. Even watching uh, this last episode, I was reminded of the, in the, like, I want to say in like the first five minutes of episode one, when they're all sitting in the theater and somebody says like, oh, we know, we all knew each other's moms and we all knew each other's dad. And then they're like, no, none of us knew our dad. Like, and you're, you, all of a sudden in that moment, you're like, oh damn, they're like each other's family and like really did step in as dad figures and brother figures and how early on in the process did you know that that was a through line? I mean, I just know from growing up in the hood that that's the through line. So it was just a part of our conversations. And, it, you know, that scene in the theater where that happens is just very, it's just very natural and matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like most people probably wouldn't go for that angle or wouldn't feel like that was an important part of it. But in this episode that you just saw, you see that they're around the table talking about how they're family men and how their kids know them and how they mm -hmm. broke that cycle. You know, mm -hmm. so it's all these little things that kind of show you what Wu Tang means to them, how it changed their lives, mm -hmm. you know, and how it's changed the lives of the people in their lives. And as storytellers, you guys did a great job of sort of planting those seeds along the way so that in the end you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that all, that all makes sense. Um, I want to talk about the, the, um, some creative choices that were made in the original content that you guys um, shot, but then also <coughs> what a big part um, visual effects and audio, especially in those, those interviews in the black void where there were moments where like you would rub a jacket and you would hear that jacket <laughs> rub or the yeah. basket, you know, you'd be talking about basketball and you'd hear the basketball or the visual effects, obviously the very rainbow color, but how did, the, how did those concepts come into play? Did you know that that was something you wanted to do along the way or something that came in the end? There's a gentleman named Hector on our team who's just, you know, he's our motion graphics animator guy. There's a scene where Method Man tells the story of being in a shelter for battered women. And the way it moves, you know, it's all, I can't take credit for it, it's Heck. He's just a super talented guy. Awesome. Um, so I want to know if there are any standout nuts, places where you guys just ran into a wall and were like, oh, God, we like can't crack this, or this isn't working, or there's any standouts where, and how, how'd you get through that? Hmm. Which one? <laughs> Go ahead, say, say what you're going to say. <laughs> All right, I think maybe the most polarizing sequence that like we just couldn't really agree on as a team were that, you know, especially, have you guys seen the, the earlier episodes, just raise of hands? I, all right, so a lot of you maybe haven't seen it, but so early on in the first and second episode, I would say there's talking heads who are kind of commenting on, you know, the impact that Wu-Tang made um, there's ta Coates, there's Jim Jarmusch, um, Prince Paul kind of speaks to the business. Um, so we had more of these people recorded and 
um, you know, we were trying to figure out a way of how to weave them in. They're like little kind of pauses and chapter markers. And one of the people that we had was Kanye West. And, um, oh. yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I can add on to whatever it is you want to say. All right. I'll, I'll throw it to Sasha in a second. <laughs> but the way, so, so when Kanye came in to do his interview, he sits down and he's kind of like, you know, I don't know really what I'm going to add. I, I don't really like documentaries where you use celebrities as talking heads. Like, you know, what I think is really interesting is that you have the Wu-Tang Clan and the Wu-Tang members telling their story. And I think his, his adjective was, that's going to be the fire part of your project, which I think everyone agreed with. But, um, you know, we, we used him as like to lead, you know, with introducing the format. Um, to kind of establish that we were going to do it, and it was, you know, kind of a funny way of, of doing it. Um, and then people just disagreed about, you know, what that did to tell the story. And, and we ended up removing him in the end and replacing him with Tanahasi Coates, who said something that was more poignant and more insightful about the way that the Wu Tang Clan's message resonated with him. Um, and from there, I would say I'm interested. To, that was really, honestly, I liked Kanye West, and I would have pushed for Kanye West. And I you did. You did push for Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I totally understood where he was coming from, and part of me felt that. Like, but it just felt like there are other moments in the film that can give give us levity, and I wanted a certain level of seriousness to set set the tone. And I'm ref going to refrain from saying anything else about Kanye in public that I haven't already said. <laughs> um, how do you guys overcome those? Like when there's a difference of opinion or, you know, the creative Well, choices? Paul is a very spirited man who uh, <laughs> has very strong beliefs. So he gets into it and, you know, but I think he's a, also a reasonable man. So we eventually land on, you know, a decision that is you know, I think serves us all. But there, there's another uh, scene that was, some people found problematic, and it's when Old Dirty Bastard's widow talks about her learning about the principles of the 5% nation and how Old Dirty locked her in a bathroom for hours, and she had to memorize, you know, this name and the meaning of it, and she said she struggled with learning, and, and then she starts to cry. And some people... You know, and so in the process of her, you know, telling the story, she talks about what the, what the name meant to her, even though she's crying. She's like, it meant something to me. And I said, so then it helped you. So you hear my voice on camera, off camera saying, so it helped you. And she said, yeah, because before my given name, what does it mean? Tracy, it doesn't mean anything. This other name means something to me. And so some people were like, it's horrible. She's been abused. Why would you put that in there, right? But the fact that she said that it helped her, I think will at least give people an understanding of what those principles meant to people and the value of it. And it's not necessarily my job as a filmmaker to judge whether well, or not. Well, and the complexity of it. That it wasn't, I mean, it's not just good or bad or, you know, that, that there's complexity to it and what it meant in their lives. Right. So, sure. some, so some folks, you know, we, we went with it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, there, there were some choices and decisions that were made that I was impressed by. I mean, at that one, I was like, okay, like, it's out of my hands, you know. Sometimes you just kind of pick your battles, and you're like, all right. And I was really impressed that somebody higher up the food chain, like, left it in and made the decision, like, because originally we were like, all right, we're not going to edit this, you know. We're just going to put it in the way she tells it, because this is her experience. And that's what ended up in there. So kudos to executives and people that I don't know for making those choices, because that's impressive to me. And also, like, yeah, we were having arguments. And that was really cool that we were able to do that, because I had never worked with Sasha and a lot of other people before. And this was, you know, there were heavy themes and issues, and people were, you know, it was pushing people's buttons. And I, that makes it interesting. And we were able to all kind of work through that. And so I think that made the work stronger. So in preparation for this panel, I, I watched back over the interviews that we, got, we did with you guys last month. And Sasha, one quote really stood out to me. Is it life-changing? 
I mean, <laughs> I, the thing is, is that I feel like it'll be very resonant in this room. Um, you said, when you're dealing with young black men from the housing projects who have little or no social capital, the idea of them creating their own capital and changing their destiny through their creativity is a very powerful idea. And so I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about that creating destiny through your creativity, taking it upon yourself to use your creative voice to, to build your own future. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what, I mean, that's what everyone does, right? Everyone uses their creativity to uh, change their life or change their destiny or feel better about themselves. You know, hip hop music ultimately is therapy for a lot of people. It's a way to express themselves. It's a way to deal with what's going on around them. You know, for me, the Wu-Tang guys are like guys that I grew up with. Like Nas talks about how the reason why people love Wu-Tang is because there's someone in Wu-Tang who looks like someone you grew up with. And Raekwon looks like my friend Ronnie Hamlin who drives a New York City bus. And so whenever I see Raekwon, I'm like, yo, Ronnie, what's up, man? It just makes me so happy. You remind me of my friend. But I think that, um, you know, I'm of it. So I understand, like, I grew up in the same kind of neighborhood, in the same kind of situation, and I know what, how words can change the, the, the path of your life. Like, I was a great rap, like, I can write rhymes, I'll roast anybody ever. When it comes to writing rhymes, I have a horrible voice. Um, I sound like MCA from the Beastie Boys. It's not a, <laughs> rest in peace MCA, I love him. A black dude who sounds like that is not good. Uh, so I wasn't really much of a MC, but writing, you know, journalism, publishing my own magazines, that's kind of how I did it. The, the, the difference is we didn't have the social capital. Um, you know, for instance, or, or people in our families who had businesses, like the first cover that they were ever on was a newspaper that I published called Beatdown. And if you see one of the early episodes, you see them flipping through that for the very first time. I, I started that with a childhood friend. We had a major falling out over the same things that Wu-Tang fall out over. We started publishing the same time as The Source. Like if, if our uncles or our fathers pulled us aside and said, come on, this is stupid, like just get over it and do it. But we had no idea. We didn't understand business. We didn't understand you know, the ego and how these things all get in the way. And when you come from the hood, you know, ego and, and, and self-esteem and all of these things that I understand now as a man, we don't necessarily understand when we're coming up. So for me, seeing Wu-Tang in many regards is like seeing myself and seeing people I grew up with. So having these conversations about how creativity has changed their lives is something that resonates with me and the fact that they made it through, the hard work that they had to put into making it, you know, it's, it's no small feat. You know, often people assume kids from the hood are lazy, but when you watch the film, you learn that they're selling newspapers on the Verrazano Bridge, they're packing bags at the grocery store, but then you also learn that they're being called N-words on the way to school and dealing with all kinds of racism. And then Raekwon tells you that he realizes that his neighborhood is, when you realize your neighborhood's worth like a quarter of a million dollars a day, that's interesting to me is what he says. What kid in America wouldn't say that? But what kid in America actually wants to sell crack? So when you think about how Wu-Tang was formed and how some of the early things came together, yeah, they were entrepreneurs. That's how they got the capital to pay for what it is that they wound up doing. But who wants to sell crack? Nobody. So, Paul, for you, I mean, obviously for Sasha, coming from a very shared experience, how, how did you bring your personal perspective while also respecting the perspective of the show in general? Yeah, I mean, I'm a white, secular Jewish male from a middle-class family in Connecticut. Um, so yeah, I'm not native to where these guys grew up. Um, and when I was, you know, in my early teens, I discovered their music and it, it was like, uh, you know, I, I was drawn to it, but I was real curious about a lot of the, the things that they were talking about. Um, you know, and this was still like, you know, I grew up like I was in middle school, high school in the 90s, and then I came to school here in New York. Um, you know, and trying to understand the, the lyrics, you know, it, it really like took me on interesting, to interesting places. Um, you know, you would read the lyrics. I think a big eye opener, I think for a lot of people from my generation was reading um, Alex Haley's 
um, autobiography of Malcolm X and, and learning about the Nation of Islam. Um, and, you know, as you learn more about the, the history of that organization, and I, I, you know, was able to identify that they were members of the Nation of Gods and Earths, which was the 5% nation, and there's really like um, interesting literature written about the history of that organization and, and you know, their role in New York City. Um, so it kind of opened doors in, to learning about their experience and their environment. Um, and um, so yeah, I, I think I had some awareness of the culture and, and their background, like coming into it. Um, and so, I, what was the question again? I, I don't. <laughs> well, his 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 interest really makes a difference. Yep. Um, you know, a lot of people, white or black, don't know much about the Five Percent Nation. The fact that he had invested time even before the project in researching and even shooting some things, to me, made me feel like we had bet, made the best decision to get someone who had the right sensitivity to understand the bigger picture conversations that I wanted to have in the film. One thing I could say about, especially like this episode, and, and I guess some, something that it, it raised, like an idea, you know, you see Inspector Dak, and, and they come back to their neighborhood where they grew up, and he's talking about how he feels, you know, so grateful for all the blessings he's received in life, but when he comes back, he's, you know, he thinks about all the people who didn't have the, the same luck I guess, in their life. And I think in the United States, and especially in New York City, like, there's the success myth that we like to celebrate stories like this. It's like the rags to riches story, or, you know, even like Frank Sinatra says, uh, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Um, but, you know, for these nine men, there were all these other people who grew up in their neighborhood who I'm sure are equally intelligent and, you know, deserving of you know, being able to escape poverty and escape their neighborhood. And, and sometimes, like, these stories, I, I feel like, can become a bit of a distraction from, you know, maybe, like, some of the other injustices that happen in the United States. Like, you know, I think people are, are resources. These guys have amazing ideas. And, you know, it, it was upsetting to see what they had to go through just to go on tour because they had gotten in trouble for, you know, possession of, uh, you know, a narcotic, and now they have to go get permission from a PO just to go do a concert in Baltimore, whereas, like, kids growing up in my neighborhood, you know, who might be in a band can just hop in their mom's minivan and go do a show. Um, and these guys, you know, they had a lot more obstacles that they had to kind of circumvent to succeed. But beyond that, there's a lot more people from their environment um, who I think think deserve, you know, greater investment in, in education and, you know, we, we all miss out, I think, when we don't invest in, in young people, I would say. Um, that's like one of the ideas that, like, their story makes me think about. You know, you bring up a good point because uh, I know there's a lot of folks in this room who are pursuing creative careers, pursuing, you know, making a living through their creativity. Um, and obstacles and risks are two big things that you just have to know are going to be part of the game. Um, can you guys each talk about, you know, a, a big risk or a big obstacle that you had to overcome to get where you are with your, where you are now? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the big secret is you say you're going to do something and just do one thing and do it well. Do one project. And typically, projects involve lots of people. So if you can organize people to help you with one project and it's a success, people are more likely the next time around when you want to do something to help you. For instance, Wu-Tang. Both RZA and Jizza had record deals. Everyone in the group was like, yo, these guys had a record deal. That's a big deal. Fine. If RZA's telling me something's going to happen, he did something. He did something he said he was going to do. Even, if, even though it wasn't a success, mm -hmm. he had proven himself. So for me, you know, I started out publishing, I published a graffiti zine by myself. And then I said, I'm going to do a hip hop newspaper. And I did, and I organized that with my friends. And then I launched a magazine called Ego Trip. And so all of these projects involved, it all started from when I was 16, I did my little graffiti zine. 
and I demonstrated to people that if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So when I needed help next time, I found like-minded creative people, photographers, writers who wanted to get published, and I said, hey, help me with this. And so it's, it's, it's a, you know, you just got to kind of listen to the voices in your head and just go for it. And it's much easier to do when you're young. You know, when I was young, I wasn't even thinking about the ramifications of anything, you know. I didn't finish school, you know. I just did what I've been, I've been doing what I've been doing since I was in my teens. Eventually, I got a fellowship to the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia on the strength of my knowledge of graffiti, you know? But if you, if you have an idea and you believe in it, you have to really focus on bringing that idea to life. Once people see that idea come to life, they believe that you have the power to help them achieve what they want to achieve. It's sort of a pyramid scheme. Mm -hmm. What about you, Nick? Uh, for me, the, the very beginning, I remember like right out of high school, like, you know, I wanted to go to film school and I couldn't get scholarships. I couldn't go to the school I wanted. So I ended up going to Suffolk County Community College out in Long Island. And um, I hustled while I was in, you know, in college and basically found out there was alumni programs to honor broadcast uh, people that came out of uh, Suffolk County Community College. So um, I decided, hey, you know what, I'm going to edit a video to honor them. So I shot and edited this video. They played it at the alumni ceremony. And sure enough, um, one of the alumni, Ram Mott, he was one of the senior editors at AME. Um, he was like, yo, you know, we have a night position available. You should come work for us. And like, like for me, like, like you, know, I, you know, I wanted to go to NYU. I wanted to go to a good school, you know? And like, I got so lucky out of community college to have that opportunity. Um, to, to go work in the field right away. And, you know, I, you know, worked through my sophomore, senior year of college, uh, worked full-time night shifts at A&E, and then went to school full-time during the day. Uh, I was a commuter student, so I would commute back and forth, back to Long Island, back into the city. Um, you know, sometimes, like, just pass out in my car <laughs> in the parking lot, like, before an 8 a.m. biology class, because for some reason biology is necessary to learn <laughs> filmmaking. Um, <laughs> But, um, but yeah, it was, you know, that hustle. And I feel like that hustle of like working all night and then working all day really toughened me up for this industry and um, helped me be a better person than if I did go to a, a, a straight out awesome four year school mm -hmm. at the start. What about you, Paul? Um, I guess. What was this question? <laughs> a, bi a big risk or a big obstacle that you overcame in, in pursuing a creative career? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a risk to, to choose to be like a creator, you know, because it's not like a, a normal profession or a normal job that offers stability, like, you know, other jobs. But I, I think right now the world's so unstable that nothing seems to offer any stability. So I guess, you know, the lesson to me would be just to follow what you're interested in and follow your heart. But maybe one of the other things that I've noticed um, since I've been, you know, working is that maybe the, it seems like the two ways to build uh, power are through people or through money. Um, so like in this story, you know, these guys by forming a group and then like involving themselves with one another, they're able to support one another and they succeed together. Um, and maybe nowadays, like, it seems like maybe the rap group might be more of a rarity because social media and all, all these kind of platforms seem to really emphasize the individual, like your Twitter handle is just you or, you know, you're putting yourself out there. But I would say if I were a young person, I would look for people with similar interests to myself and I would try to support them and try to engage them in things that I'm interested in because I. You know, even though you have all these tools now, and yeah, you can get a camera and you can go out and like make a movie by yourself, it's much more rewarding and interesting to do it with a group of, of peers. Um, so that would be, and I, I, I have some friends who definitely have formed collectives and that, you know, I'm friends with them, but I'm not involved with them. And I would say those people, to, in my eyes, they have a, a more rewarding um, work work life, those people who've done that. Okay, so I'm gonna, I have a couple uh, questions from the live stream and then we're gonna open it up uh, to some questions in the audience. 
Um, so <laughs> G Gaines uh, asks, did, well, I'm just I'm going to make this more of a general question. Uh, did you use morph cut in the project at all? I I didn't do any morphs. Um, you know, we had three cameras covering the interviews. Um, I, maybe one of the issues with the morph is like I don't know if it analyzes the background in order to kind of create the transition. We didn't have a, a background, so maybe your eye was more tuned into noticing where the morph was. Like I might have tried it a couple times, but it, it didn't seem to work. Yeah, G yeah. Gaines was trying to spot one. He or she asked about a specific cut. If that uh, was <laughs> we've, we've used it on other projects, but um, just not on this project. Not on this one. Yeah. Um, and then Victoria asks, did you find any of the nine members intimidating? It seems like a massive amount of ideas and personalities to deal with all at once. No, because again, <laughs> these are like people I grew up with, so no, not at all. All right, any questions in the audience? We have a mic that can come around. Here in the front. Hey, how's it going? Good. Hey. I was curious how much of the uh, VHS, there was the one scene in maybe the second or third episode where it showed all of the VHS, you know, that room with all of those incredible, you know, archives in it. How much of, how many of those tapes did you guys capture? Or how much of that stuff is still, you know, only on VHS? It's actually three quarter inch tape, which is in, you know, in crazy old school format. Uh, that's Ralph McDaniels. He's the host of something called Video Music Box, which is the longest running music, mu music video show in the world. It actually still comes on, 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 on cable, public access. Um, we used, in, in a few of my projects, basically every hip hop project I've ever done, I've gone to Ralph. So we used a fair amount of stuff from Ralph for sure. Actually, to speak to the bigger topic of archival in this film, um, you know, like, in today's world, capturing your life on the constant is much more normal than it was back in the day of, you know, the beginnings of, of Wu-Tang. And you guys got a lot of, like, Vanessa not, is not, here somewhere. The not archival professional. master is here. Yeah. Vanessa, are you here? Show yourself. Round of applause for Vanessa, yeah. I will yeah. say. <laughs> I mean, she, you know, forged great personal relationships with folks, and, you know, there's a level of trust that she established. Um, they had a lot of trust in her, which eventually led to trust in the overall situation. So. Yeah. But, you know, back then, you're a rapper, figure there's 10 guys in a group, someone's got a video camera. <laughs> you know, that was like a big deal. So people have all this stuff that they've shot, and now it's in their at and no one's thinking about it. They never transferred it. It's sitting in a box somewhere, but it's out there. I mean, how did you, I guess it's a question for you, but like even going about finding it, like. Uh, uh, give Vanessa <laughs> the microphone. <laughs> Where is she? Go ahead, ask. Hi. Yeah, yeah, how'd you go about finding it? Um, well, you know, you start with the research, really, and just looking into every, every interview, every video that you can find anywhere, and, and also talking to a lot of people. The best stuff you find from just, in, most bizarre places. There's a person in the room who was a student, Theo, right, at uh, Br Brooklyn College. Ended up going to Riz's nine. He was called the number on the white label record. <laughs> RZA Riza answered. He went to their house and brought video cameras only because they were lazy and thought they'd use it for audio so they could transcribe it later for an article, right? And we have some of that footage in the film. Um, they were at Morningstar Apartment in 1992 before Wu-Tang was really Wu-Tang to the world. Wow. And um, I found him through another DJ. And, you know, the DJs all knew each other and talked to each other. So it's like getting, just building those relationships and keeping in contact with people and reminding them that you're still looking for things and, you know, digging, 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 and digging more. And when something comes in and you see wow, this is something, you just rush it to edit as fast as you can, you know, and say, look at what we found. And luckily, you know, Paul and Sasha were just really great at, you know, looking at stuff and, you know, j just really being communicative and vocal about what they needed. And, um, and then the Wu-Tang was really fantastic about 
opening up their, not all of them, but a lot of them were, were very fantastic about opening up their lives and really being very generous with their time and just their contacts. And um, going out to Staten Island, you know, it's like my second home now, Park Hill. So um, yeah, shout out to Park Hill. Yeah, shout out to you. I mean, that was not a small feat, I'm sure. Um, any other questions in the room? Yeah, here in the pink. Um, I'm not exactly too sure how to like phrase this question, but since like the beginning of time, artists and artistry is what led to like big and significant changes within the world, within culture, within pushing people forward um, to the next frontier in general. I think we're at a point now where we need all of that art. Um, what would you guys or any of you want to take, say to like a young creator like myself or a young, somebody who's inspiring because we all have the energy, we all believe that the world is like not where it needs to be. Um, and we all have the energy to pretty much um, catapult to a, us to a whole new light. Um, what would you say to like a young creator of um, the next generation of like what particular to look for or um, what, uh, what are some of the advice initially that you would give um, to just, I guess to put more of your um, input of like a more of a, a positive light to everything that's going on right now? I mean, times like this typically produce the best art. Um, that's how I see it. So I just think that the biggest thing that gets in the way of most people expressing themselves is fear. And as corny as it sounds, like failure is like incredible. Like if you can get over your failure and get up and do it again, that's when you're gonna have the most success. Because people are afraid of failure and they're afraid of what other people think, they don't, it gets in the way of them doing what they really want to do. And me personally, I never really cared what people thought because at the end of the day, I'm more interested in entertaining and pleasing myself than everyone else. So you've got to start with yourself. If you can entertain yourself, if you can feel like you've achieved something, that's where you have to keep your focus. Otherwise, you know, you're going to spend your time looking at other people's Instagrams and what are they doing? They're posing. Everyone on Instagram is a poser. They're not putting up photos, and, 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 and I talk it because I'm not on it. Maybe my band is on it, but I'm not personally on it. But so many people, no one's putting that photo up of like when their dog died and they're crying. Everything is how good your casserole looks. Look at my sneakers. Look at me pretending to be making a movie. Don't spend your time putting up photos of things that you think or you say you're gonna do. Just do it. That the power of doing is where it all stands. And connecting with that power and that confidence and being open to failure and not letting that failure keep you down is where the power is. I noticed recently, at some point, people started referring to like filmmaking and films as content. And they would call stuff content that actually doesn't have anything in it, like whatsoever. And it's, just, <laughs> it's like, it's such, I mean, it's crazy. And um, I think that kind of speaks to the social media phenomenon. I also remember being a young person and not thinking that like my friends or my sphere that I lived in, that those people were interesting. Um, so I was always like looking at what I thought was interesting was so somewhere else, you know? And now looking back at it, I have nothing like documented of and I'm like, wow, like I always, that's all I think about are these friends that I had as a young person. And I'm like, wow, that guy, you know, he, like something that someone said to me when I was 20 might stick with me till today. So, you know, be mindful of the people around you and the people that you have access to because, you know, a lot of people have great ideas and are great storytellers. And sometimes it's just about, you know, spending time with the people that you already know and have access to and can put a camera in, in front of, that might be where like, you know, wh where you'll create your best work. I would say that would be like the advice I would give to myself if, if I was younger. Also to your experience, Sasha, I mean, how important is being true to your own experience or speaking from your personal voice rather than trying to say what you think other people want to hear or say 
you know, try to front? Well, yeah, I mean, having a unique perspective just establishes your value. If I told stories the way that everyone else did, or if I had a similar perspective, where's my value? And I think, you know, mass appeal, I think that's what we as an organization provide. I think we have a unique perspective, um, and that's why we continue to get opportunities. But if we just did what everyone else did, if we thought about hip hop just like everyone else, I wouldn't give us any money to make anything. Awesome. Well, with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Thanks, everybody, from the live stream for watching. And let's give one more round of applause to these guys. <laughs>